for those of you who don't know me, there's a lot of people who haven't, who I haven't seen here before because they're not part of the history uh, crowd. Uh, but welcome, I'm Derek Neal from the Department of History, and uh, I'm very glad to welcome Dr. Matt Farish from the University of Toronto, and my co-host, uh, Kirsten Greer, from, who, is, is in, who teaches in both history and uh, the uh, MES NESC program, will introduce Matt Farish. So, Kirsten. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm in both the history and geography department, as you mentioned, and I'm a trained historical geographer, just like our uh, speaker today. So it's my pleasure to actually introduce Dr. Matt Farish to our first joint MES-MSC history seminar series talk that we hope to do at least once a semester. And Dr. Matt Farish is an associate professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Geography. He pursued a PhD at UBC, finishing in 2003, and after that he pursued a postdoc at Memorial University, oh, sorry, at U of T in uh, American History and International Relations, and taught cultural geography at Memorial before heading back to the University of Toronto in 2006. And his first book that was published with the University of Minnesota in 2010 is entitled The Contours of Americans, America's Cold War, which focuses on the relationship between geographical knowledge and Cold War geopolitics in the 1960s. And he continues to work in this area, including a forthcoming essay on the Ground Observer Corps, Skywatchers, in the Journal of American History. And furthermore, he's currently working on two longer projects, a history of the distant early warning or dew line, and a study of 20th century American military research on hostile environments. And as a historical geographer, he also works at the intersections of history of science and environmental history, which makes him an ideal uh, first guest speaker for our seminar series. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Matt Farish. Hi everybody, um, I'm really happy to be here. It's my first trip to North Bay. I've wanted to visit for a long time. Um, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. I'm just really sorry that I can't stay longer uh, and see a little bit more. I have a, a six month old daughter at home and last night was my first night away from her ever. So I'm feeling a little bit um, weird. Uh, hello to Lakehead as well. Um, thanks to Derek and especially to Houston for facilitating all of this um, and for the kind introduction. Um, Kirsten and I have crossed paths a number of times at various geography conferences, but usually only for about 10 minutes at a time, and then we start talking about hockey, and it all kind of goes downhill from there. Um, but over the last several years, um, her work in historical geography has really been a, a model of intellectual energy and originality for me. Um, so yesterday, I spent uh, a fun several hours in the collections room at the Canadian Forces Museum of Aerospace Defense down the road. I'm looking at documents related to radar lines and the Ground Observer Corps, and now is my chance to thank Bethany, who is here for facilitating all of that. I'm not going to talk about it today, though, because I, I can't possibly uh, process what I saw in, in a day. But this afternoon, what I'd like to do is provide you with a kind of snapshot that sits at the intersection of the two large projects that Kirsten mentioned. And this is a place that I've been stuck sometimes excitingly, other times quite frustratingly, for the last couple of years. Um, and my presentation is going to shift from comfortable ground to real work in progress, and from something of a sort of frame for inquiry to some finer grained evidence. And I chose to do this for a couple of reasons. First, it reflects my location along that uh, painful scholarly continuum. I've done a lot of research, I'm starting to piece my cases and arguments together, to the point that I've essentially written, I realized a couple of days ago, two halves of books. <laughs> By one measure, that is clearly a very foolish thing to do, um, but I hope you'll see that this, these two lines of inquiry are largely complementary. And second, though, I'm really keen to hear what you, as an interdisciplinary <coughs> audience, uh, make of all this, my approach. Um, it's a rare opportunity for me, and I really welcome your comments and criticisms, too, please. So, for the sake of reference, here is something of an outline. I'm going to start by saying just a little bit more about these two projects and what unites them. Besides historical concurrence, they're both very much situated within the 1940s and 1950s, but besides that, they're also united by an interest in the process of militarization, a very kind of difficult thing to come to grips with, I found, and the geographical consequences, more specifically, of militarization. <coughs> 
but also the knowledge, the geographical knowledge generated to facilitate that process of militarization. And this is what I mean by regions imagined, simulated, and transformed. Militarization, as I said, is a very elusive, slippery word, but surely it does incorporate these varieties of change and transformation. My emphasis throughout is going to be on the U.S. Department of Defense and its largely compatible Canadian counterpart. So, we can talk about sovereignty and national distinction later, nationalism, uh, but uh, I'm going to slide past that for reasons I can explain. So with a few important exceptions, these two institutions, um, rather shockingly, have been ignored by geographers, certainly before, let's say, 2001. Of course, geographers working outside of militaries, which after all are significant employers of geographers, and geographers situated within a you know, quite lengthy critical turn that recognize the role of their discipline, geography, as a serious aid to war and to empire finally came to the realization that we might have something to say about actually existing militaries. And this is also verging on a bit of inside baseball, so I will say no more about that here, but maybe we can take that up later. So before um, specifically considering military activities in the Arctic, I think it's helpful to reflect a little bit on the infrastructure behind these activities, on, if you like, the military approach to the North, and the shaping of something called the Arctic as a military and geopolitical region of interest. So the simple premise here is that the northern reaches of this continent were deemed strategically and scientifically significant at more or less the same time. As the preface to one uh, synoptic volume on the subject puts it, American and Canadian research in the Arctic greatly increased about 1946. Quite specific about that. Notably as well, earlier contributions, with some exceptions, were largely descriptive terrible thing to say about other people's science. So this brings us to the boards component of my title, to these understudied agencies in both the United States and Canada that emerged in the 1940s to promote and coordinate and sponsor northern military activities. Obviously not all northern research during this period was military in nature, but it's really impossible to ignore the pervasiveness of military fingerprints during this period. And this research included, but was not limited to, the human sciences, which is a sort of somewhat blurry interdisciplinary field concerned with the scientific study of human experience. That's my rather vague definition. But like every other intellectual pursuit, essentially these human sciences have a Cold War history. They have an affiliation with the Cold War. But it's really manifest most directly in disciplines like medicine and physiology, which is a fascinating field. Um, and more specifically, historically, uh, almost kind of anachronistic subjects these days like human factors and human engineering. This was the language of the time. Now, I don't have training in physiology or any other human science for that matter, but I think it's still possible to recognize that Cold War human sciences, as they were done by the US and Canadian militaries, were basically concerned with one thing, and that is the relationship between bodies, those of soldiers mostly, but not exclusively, and non-temperate environments. This was the central preoccupation for the military human sciences during the early Cold War. And in that sense, the Arctic, as a sort of region of interest, is really just a category on a list corresponding to the global presence of the American armed forces in the 40s and 50s. I don't think it's too crude to suggest that the Canadian military essentially served as kind of a helper, an aid to this study of this one northern category in particular. So this global presence, which really, I mean, it has a longer history in terms of the military globalism of the US, but it really takes off during the Second World War. It's waxed and it's waned and it's shifted a little bit over the last seven decades or so, but more importantly, it has endured. It's still present today. And so too um, have many of the military facilities I will mention today. They've changed their names, they may have moved slightly in terms of location, but they're still there. And I think that's fascinating when we work back uh, to the beginnings. So it's, I think it's pretty hard to dispute that the militarization of the North American Arctic since the 1940s has been consequential. An image like this uh, on Baffin Island, taken very in the last couple of years, makes that point 
pretty clearly. But like the cleanup of a dewline site, comprehending these consequences, particularly over long sweeps of time, vast stretches of space, is pretty challenging. And so near the end of my time, I'll mention one approach to this problem of comprehension that really reflects my own attachment to research in libraries and archives, to sort of thinking through the evidence that we find in libraries and archives to understand the long uh, sweep of militarization in the North. So it's a decidedly partial approach. Obviously, there are many, many other ways in which we could talk about studying militarization, including, most importantly, field work and oral histories conducted in North, Northern communities. But the reason I've chosen uh, to think about libraries and archives here is because they raise really important additional questions about how we actually study militaries um, and that project of critical military geographies that I sketched at the outset and I'll turn to in more detail now. Okay, so during the 1940s and 1950s in particular, the United States Air Force, with the assistance of a host of Canadian and American contractors, builds this vast radar network across the North American Arctic from Alaska to Greenland and eventually beyond. This is joined, the dew line, by two more radar chains, the Mid-Canada and the Pine Tree Line. There's a pine tree station not far from here outside of Sudbury. The dew line, the distant early warning line, was a physical manifestation of both geopolitical anxiety and technological hubris. It was expensive, it was difficult, and it had tremendous lasting consequences for Arctic landscapes and lives. The history of the Dew Line is a pretty complicated one. It's a northern story, and this itself is a huge generalization, but it's also a narrative that connects northern places and peoples with other southern locales, places like powerful political and military institutions in Ottawa and Washington, to centers for strategic and scientific research in Santa Monica, California, or uh, Lexington, Massachusetts. So the Dew Line has this northern history that's also very much a Cold War history. <coughs> and those of you who are familiar with the latter field of Cold War history will know that the North really doesn't figure in it, certainly only schematically, if at all, in most discussions of the Cold War. And this is particularly unfortunate, this division of historical fields, because it really echoes the way in which the Arctic itself was treated by these sorts of institutions during the development of the Dew Line as a homogenous, little-known, largely empty region that presented significant environmental obstacles, but very few other obstacles to intensive radar construction and military activity. These were obstacles that theorists in places like Rand and the Lincoln Lab took seriously, but they also believed that they could be managed and ultimately overcome. If you look at promotional films and publications around the line, they frequently treat this environment as wilderness or wasteland, uh, complete with, quote, harsh and unrelenting disciplines. I like that line. So these sorts of characterizations, perhaps not surprising, but these sorts of characterizations have been durable and they have been consequential. There's a quote from the leader of the recent remediation uh, effort in the north out of Royal Military College. It was remote, hardly anyone lived there, these sites were in the middle of nowhere, far from anyone's imagination, and therefore the environment wasn't at the fore. Basically that's why we polluted the heck out of the place. It was remote, nobody lived there, in the middle of nowhere. You, you see the language here, the description, the emptying out of this place of uh, inhabitants, human inhabitants, but also a kind of recognition that it's just a long way away, far from anyone's imagination. But obviously this sort of distancing, this historical distancing, this geographic distancing needs to be treated with some serious skepticism. Even if we go back to the 1950s, the idea of the mysterious north, as people like Pierre Burton wrote about, it's a realm of tremendous cultural and political significance in North America, even if the mysterious north was a rather generic thing. 